you can look into somebody's eyes and at first they think, you can see, you can see all their thoughts go by when you can stay in the mantra. You can see them saying, what's he doing? What's he, is he coming on to me? So, yeah, and then it just to stay there, oh, my nay, penny, oh, my nay, penny, oh, my nay, penny, until pretty soon they vibrate all their paranoia, except all they get back is absolutely clear message. They don't get back anything that reinforces the paranoia because you're just here, you're just right here in this mantra. Until pretty soon they come and come and come until they're here. And the minute they get here, there's a great feeling of release in them. Because the place we meet is in the mantra. The place we meet is behind all of the stuff, all of the stuff. And when you can stay in the place behind the stuff, you look at everybody coming towards you and you see all of the stuff of life. That becomes the, the way of developing great awareness of how it all is. That brings you into harmony with the world around you. Because the harmony comes as you can calm down and get free of your own ego melodrama, your own patent place, your own whatever your drama is. Now, you look at somebody really that is sexually very exciting to you. See, that's a good one. And you look at them and there is a thing that pulls you into the little melodrama of turning on. You start to feel arousal happen in the whole business. See, and your eyes get get a little, you know, like you start to do the thing. And then you go in, om, om, and they fed me, om, om, and they fed me, and then you see that whole drama happening. And you see, because the way in which every time a person does something towards you, you're like, you're just sitting there doing Om Mane Ped Me Hong, and they look at you like, I really like you, see? And you get a certain flash inside from that. Your responding organism, you respond to whatever drama they're projecting. And you can either climb into that and say, well, that's because I'm really a nice guy, you know, or you can go back and oh, when they had me, or they look at you like, I don't trust you. See? Suddenly you become untrustworthy. You know, that feeling inside, well, if they don't trust me, there must be something, whatever impure, you know, people who are very critical of others. And they go around always creating that thing in you, like there must be something in me that's wrong somewhere. And you can feel that in you, but the mantra allows you to look at the feeling in yourself and look at the thing in them and stay in a place behind each of those. Until finally, when you meet another person who is centered, it's just like you met somebody else who's doing Om Mane Padme Hung, you see. Because you meet them and they're right here too. And they see all the drama as drama. And the interesting thing is, it only takes the flash of a look to come to that place when you're centered enough. See? You watch a person, it's like a pinball machine going through apples and bananas and oranges, you know. You look at them and you see paranoia, love, seduction, anger, fear, distrust, blah, 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 brrr, and then here we are. And sometimes you can walk down the street and from the time you meet somebody's eyes coming this way, it may take just this long to go through that whole trip because time is not the relevant period. It'll happen just as fast as you are straight. Because each human being will run through the whole category of places we can get hung up together. <coughs> and if you're at any one of those places, if they find you home in that place, that's it, baby. That's what the relationship is for that round. So. So the game is always running through, and that one too, sure, and that one too, and that one too, and that one too, see, and taking that, and that, and that. And the far out thing is when you're walking down the street and you see some, like, um, most unlikely person to be here coming down the street, somebody, you see somebody with a cane and a bad back and a heavy burden and oh, the look, and you look into their eyes and suddenly, boom, here we are. Just that little flash of here we are. And it's behind all the melodrama, behind all the melodrama. 
That's a conscious contact with another person. Conscious contact. Otherwise, you're only living out mechanical dramas all the time. Some stimulus is arousing a set of responses in you, and you're running through your cycle. And then mantra just keeps you so that, for example, mantra with me at this moment, since the thing that is takes you a little further to think about, see, once we get into words, you get busy listening again. You're not doing your mantra, most of you now. You're busy listening to me, which means you're just caught in another melodrama. Like all the time I'm talking to you, Om Mane Padme Yang, Om Mane Padme Yang, Om Mane You can use the eyes in the same way as you use mantra. I don't know that I can. I don't know that we can demonstrate this as a group. Perhaps we can. I don't know. It's very tricky. If you look into somebody's eyes. I'll do it with you just to show you how it works. And I look into your eyes and I'm talking to you now. Okay? And you're listening to me. And your hand is on your foot and your hair is over your glass and we're both aware of that. And we're aware that I'm talking and the words are coming out of this mouth and those ears are listening and here we are. The eyes become the mantra. The eyes are the same place and all the words are just stuff going around the eyes. Okay, can you hear that? Now, what you develop is a vehicle. The vehicle in this case is the eyes. It's totally impersonal. And often what I do, which is used to be called psychotherapy <laughs> in a number of incarnations back, uh, which is behavior change, I guess you'd call it, or something, is to look into somebody's eyes and say, say, Anything you can think of that you can't say to me, say to me. That's the fiercest statement, requirement you can make of another person. Because all the thoughts that they would hide from you, which would keep you an object to them, which could keep you him, you say, okay, let's cut. You want to get, up, you want to get on with it? You, what do you say? Should we get enlightened? Let's get going. Or would you like to play like you'd like to get enlightened? You no, know, I really want to get on with it. You really want to get on? Yes, I want you to be my teacher. All right, I, you know, for me to be your teacher, I've got to be inside you. You're going to let me in? Oh, I'd like to let you in, but I don't know how. All right, the simple rule of the game is I'm going to look into your eyes. Anything you can think you can't say to me, say to me. Now, the person looks at you and they say, well, I can't think of anything. <laughs> I say, well, there's no rush. You're <laughs> just doing, oh, my name, ped me, on, oh, my name, ped me, on, oh, my name, ped me, on, and oh, my name, ped me, on, oh, my name, ped me, on. and then, you see, I just, don't say, you don't have to say it aloud, just think now. If I were looking directly in your eyes and I gave you the instruction, anything you can think which you cannot say to me, which embarrasses you, shames you, frightens you, disconcerts you, would feel like it would cause some discomfort in you. That if you said it to me, say it to me. All right. Now, just think of what that would be. So somebody says to me, "You look like an old lecherous, vile." You know, and I'm looking in their eyes and saying, "Oh, man, they tell me, and oh, man, they tell me." And inside, I feel like the old lecherous, vile, and I'm seeing that feeling in me and saying. Yes, and that one too. And then they keep looking and pretty soon they say, you look like Buddha. There's light coming out from you everywhere and you're so beautiful. And I feel so beautiful and light coming out of me everywhere. And I think, and that one too. <laughs> Sometimes you like to hold on to them, but yeah, and that one too. <laughs> oh, <my laughs> it's really being Buddha, you know. <laughs> I say, I, I say, I want to pick up that caviar and crackers, <laughs> lemon and, you know. But now it is literally true. There is nothing anybody can say to me that makes any difference. People say, isn't that too bad? <laughs> <laughs> well, is it or isn't it? What do you lose and what do you gain? What's the bird in the hand and what's the bird in the bush? What is that all about? Because to the extent that you can center that way, 
you allow another person to get free of their own melodrama, which includes all the stuff that they hold on to, which keeps them away from other human beings, keeps them being an island under themselves. And the faster in which you and I can move into a space where here we are. There's nothing that has to be done. Nobody has to do anything. <coughs> It's just a state of isness, a state of isness, and it's behind all the drums. And it can go on and on and on and on and on. I've sat with some people looking directly into their eyes for, for 10 hours. And they go through and they think, oh, well, there's nothing else. And I can look and I can see. When I look into their eyes, I can see light. It's like a light coming out of their face. And then I see a kind of opaqueness. And the opaqueness is their thought forms. That's what the opaqueness is. It's that they're still thinking. They're still back in their thinking. And all thoughts finally <coughs> fall away. And then we experience light. We just, the two of us, come into the light together. The minute you can stop your thoughts and I mine, we are in the light. But the problem is you can't stop your thoughts. You can only let them fall away. And the way you let them fall away in this case is using the other person's eyes as the central focus place. And then seeing all the thoughts as clouds that are going by is just stuff. And most of them just come like, uh, uh, like uh, the walls are brown. Well, there's no reason why you can't tell me the walls are brown. So that isn't one you have to say. It's a thought that comes, you notice it, and it goes away. And here we are, and the walls are brown. And the floor has a carpet on it. The floor has a carpet on it. But then a thought will come into my head that I can't tell you. And then immediately there's a thickening of the opaqueness, because I've already got a thought. And in, in Freud's terms, I'm cathecting libido. I'm attaching energy to that place and turning it off. And it's all that set of those things that keeps that opaqueness going between us. Until pretty soon, any thought can come in Go through, go out. Come in, go through, go out. You're done with it the minute you note it. It doesn't hold on because there's no reason to hold any of them. They all just go through just as fast as you can bring them in, note them, bye. And then the thoughts start to calm down. And then the two of you come into a place where you go behind thought. And that's the whole game. It's the game of Tai Chi. It's the game of meditation. It's the game of mantra. It's the game of calming down, breaking your identification with your own thought forms. Okay? With your own thought forms, whatever they may be. Start to think about, well, what do I do next? The answer to what will I do next is, Om Mane Padme, Om Mane Padme. If in doubt, do mantra. That's the simple name of the game. For the rest of your life, if in doubt, do mantra. Or do mantra and everything else will take care of itself. That's the faith. That's the statement based on the faith. And I could say to you, all right, if you would like to be an enlightened being, all you have to do for the rest of your life is do mantra. Don't ever have to do another thing. Well, what happens if I need to go to the toilet? Don't worry. <laughs> You'll get to the toilet. Just keep doing the mantra. Just stop the mantra to go to the toilet. Ramakrishna tells the story of a little boy who says, Mommy, will you wake me if I need to go to the bathroom? <laughs> the mother says, don't worry about it. <laughs> you know, when you need to go to the bathroom, it'll take care of itself. When you try to meditate, which is For example, I hope many of you experienced what it was like when we were eating and when, when that very far out beautiful piano playing started. Like the piano playing is groovy and we're all digging it and at the same place we're consciously eating. See? Now at first I go through, oh, piano's playing. See? How can I concentrate on being conscious if the piano's playing, <laughs> on eating? See? Then I realize that in order to do my task, I'm turning off part of the universe. Then I say, and that too. Then I am listening to the piano and consciously eating at the same moment. Doing the mantra simultaneously. People get under some, they get attached to a linear thought form, and that's got to be broken because 
really, ultimately, you just think in gestalts. You just are aware of all the things happening around you at any moment. You don't think about them in linear terms. Now, it is useful when you're beginning to do these things to cut down the amount of external stimulation. That's why most or many of you have moved away from cities and are living in much quieter environments. My optimum place I live in is where there's no electricity, where there is no, there are no people coming and going, where there's no traffic, where there's no nothing. In fact, the best place you can work if you're really going to start the game fiercely is to find a cave underground where it's just rock and just go and sit down in the cave. Because then you cut out all the stimulation because there's nothing groovier than birds in the trees, but you've heard birds in the trees 10,000 times before. And every time you hear a bird, you've got to go label, oh, there's a bird. And that's another thought form. And what you find is the entire environment keeps sucking you into thought forms all the time. Once you have calmed your mind down to one pointedness, then you can enjoy nature, you can groove, you can do anything you want, you can hang out in cities and do all that. But until then, you have to create at certain points an environment where you can cut down the amount of external stimulation. It might be earplugs, it might be whatever it is. It might be going to a closet in your own house. I've been saying to people, if you want to have a really high vacation this year, okay, <laughs> really cheap and high, really cheap and really high, just clear out a closet, see, and go in and sit down and arrange so that food is left once a day by the closet door and there's a toilet nearby and everybody knows what you're doing so nobody will bug you and just go in and sit down for two weeks and I'll tell you, somebody new will come out. It'll take you through trips you never believe. Because most of us are just copping out into external stimulation all the time. You see it yourself. Light a, I, watch, I was watching people light cigarettes before at lunch. I was watching that cold stimulus sequence of attention. You watch people walking out to look at nature. Looking around, what's that noise? What was that? What's that? I got to know what was that. It's important. What's happening in the world today? What do you say? Should we go down to the... Did you turn on? Have you seen that? Taste that? Feel that? Smell that? Think about that. Let's think about this. Maybe we ought to think about... These are all stuff. They're all lots of stuff. And the idea is that all that stuff is there and it's all available when you become the master, when you're the servant of it all, it's all too much. It's all just taking you on a trip in the illusion. Deeper and deeper and deeper all the time. So the first thing is you've got to calm down until all thoughts just go by. All thoughts go by. Now to do this, you develop a method of meditation. And there are many methods of meditation and each person must find his own vehicle. Some people can sit and meditate. Others, from where we're starting, can't do that. And they would be able to do mantra all day long. Others can't do that, and they will be able to sing holy songs because they can open their heart. Others can do whatever method works. They all go to the same place. All yogis go to union. That's the game. Well, we Yes, well, Gyan Yoga, the yoga of the intellect beating the intellect, leads to exactly the same place. The only difficulty is that it is infinitely or finitely, but almost infinitely seductive to stay in the dualism of knowing you know. You see? That is, the role of the experiencer or the knower is the one that must be transcended. And the thing about the intellect is that the thinking mind takes an object. It thinks about something. And therefore, it keeps preserving that relationship between the thinker and that which is thought about. Okay. And you can keep thinking about things until you see more and more how it all is and more and more how it all is and more and more how it all is. But ultimately, there must be the surrender or the transcendence of the thinker and that which is thought about. Okay? Is that in relation to what you just said. 
so that many of the people who have tried to use the method of Gyan Yoga, of the mind beating the mind, often get caught in knowing they know because they get so close. Like uh, the prime example in my own lifetime, in my personal context, was Aldous Huxley. I mean, Aldous was a very conscious being. And at the same moment, he couldn't give up knowing he knew. He was just seeing how it all was so exquisitely. It's called, it's the Godhead. It's the highest place on the causal plane. It's the highest of the highest planes. It's the Godhead. It's the place before you go into the formless. It's the place where you're, you're seeing all form. You're seeing the universal laws. You're seeing how it all is at every level. But then you have to give up being he who sees. It's like the first time you experience bliss, astral bliss. Wow, the bliss is so great, you just want to bathe in it. And the instructions say, enjoy the bliss and then go beyond the experiencing of the bliss by becoming the bliss. Same way you go beyond the experiencing of knowing to become that which is known. Now, knowing can take you a long way, however. Very long way. But the end point is always the mindless state, is the no mind, is the place of no mind. Where thinking becomes the servant, not the master. Just like your hand doesn't go up by itself, you lift your hand. Well, the same way your thinking mind is available when you need it. But all the rest of the time, it's just uh, absolutely nothing. Nothing. And then you begin to see that your thinking mind is needed less and less and less and less and less. And that's very, very far out. When you begin to understand that wisdom and knowledge are two entirely different matters. And that, that knowledge is very finite and very... The collection of objective knowledge is like a drop in the bucket compared to what it is to be wise. Because being wise is when you get out of the time-space locus that says, I am me who knows, then you merge with that which is around you and you become wisdom. And when you become wisdom, you don't know you know. You gave that one up. <coughs> but you are wise. And then whatever response comes out of you is the optimum response. It's the optimum response that comes out of total conscious merging with it all. At the same time, you are like, you're like a dull normal. Nothing's happening inside you at all. When you meet a, a no-mind person, you just are awed by their simplicity. Their simplicity. And they can be talking about the most complex, exquisite machinations of life in the most intellectual terms, and you still see that it's only dance stuff they're doing. That behind it all, they are totally childlike in the sense of nothing. They're just naive. They're unworldly. It's all, yeah, it's the way it they didn't collect it. They don't identify with it. So, the technique of Gyan Yoga is beautifully exemplified in what's called the koan, which is the technique, you know, of foiling the rational mind by giving it an, an impossibility or a paradox. And when you can understand it and say yes and embrace the whole thing, then you've transcended the rational, linear process of thought. But the other techniques of meditation are just to take one place and focus on it and bring your mind down and down and down and down and down and down until you can stay in one place and all other thoughts go by. Be it somebody's eyeballs, be it your breathing going in and out, be it the mantra, be it a face, be it whatever it is. Until there's only that, and then you wipe that one out. That's the secret, that's the trip, that's the steps in what's called Pratyahara, Dharana, Dhyana, and Samadhi in, in Patanjali system. You go in, you sit down. See, I'll go into my room and I'll sit down, and I'll get comfortable. And then I pick whatever method of meditation I'm going to use at that moment. 
whichever one happens to appear is the one I use. So if it's, for example, a focus somewhere in one of my centers, I work with that. I may be focusing on the light in my ajna and just bring the light in more and more and more right here. I might be focusing on my breath, on my muscles going up and down with my breath. Take this one, this one that I always teach, the Satipatthana Vipassana. Rising, falling, rising, falling. All these muscles just go flip, flip with every breath. Flip, flip. So you just get so rising, falling. Rising, falling. Just take 15 minutes every morning and every evening and sit down and just watch those muscles go up and down. And that's your instructions. Do nothing else all the time, those 15 minutes, but do that. Any other thought that comes into your head, let it go by. All you got to do is watch rising, falling, rising, falling, rising. Keep doing it until pretty soon there's just those little muscles inside here that are doing that flip, flip, flip. And in your head is this rotating set of words, rising, falling, rising, falling. Now, the baby makes a noise, the baby gurgles. We all note the baby gurgling. You can note it if you want. Baby gurgle. Then rising, falling. Rising, falling. Window rattles, window rattles. Rising, falling. Rising, falling. Knee hurts, knee hurts. Rising, falling. Rising, falling. You just keep coming back to that place. You're just slowly foiling the mind's ability to take you on trips all the time, that's all. And the calmer and the more centered you get, like in Tai Chi, where the movement, the body movement, your consciousness is right where that movement is. It's nowhere else. You're not thinking about other things. You're not thinking, here I am doing Tai Chi. Just the movement, that's all there is. Just that consciousness goes right with it. That's the whole business. Total one-pointedness. In karate, the way a board is broken is that your full consciousness is right on the back end of your hand when you do that. All the energy is right there because you're not thinking about anything else. You're not thinking of, now I'll break the board. One-pointedness of mind is an extraordinary, extraordinary vehicle for... It's the prerequisite, it seems to me, of the entire game. In terms of two strategies for getting on with the work, I'll give you the maximum and the minimum strategy that I can conceive of and work with. The maximum strategy was when I lived in the temple. Up at 4.30, bathing in the river, back, bathing with mantra. Up into... You don't get up immediately. You start around 2 in the morning. You're sleeping on a hard surface. You don't sleep too deeply. Right? You didn't eat. You only eat at noon. You don't eat in the evening so that you're very light, so that you don't sleep that deeply. And around 2 in the morning, you start a dream. You start the mantra going, right, when you come out of deep sleep. And so you're, oh, man, they me, oh, man, they me. And the dreams are going by. They're just astral work you're doing. 
Just like this is physical work we're doing. It's just stuff you're doing to live out your karma. And all you do it is do it consciously. Note your astral life going by you. Dream consciously. It's the same place you get into when the alarm went off and you don't want to give up the dream yet and you remember to get up, but you also try to keep the dream till you finish with it. Everybody goes through that where there's a two-level operation. When you do this for about two or three hours. And then 5.30, 6, 4.30, whenever it is, you get up and you wash and you do your toileting and all that, and then you come and you sit down in front of your puja table. You sit down in front of a place you have designated as a place where there is no other game but the game of becoming conscious. It's a crutch. These are all crutches I'm talking about, and they will all go ultimately. When you're in no mind, you can just live just like everybody else all the time without any... But these are all crutches. You sit down at a place, you may have some pictures around of beings who've made it that help like Buddha or Christ or whoever it is that you want to hang out with, Ramakrishna, Ramana Maharshi. Some current ones, such as Sai Baba, Kirpal Singh, Meha Baba. I don't know, and you might just have their pictures around or not. If pictures turn you off, don't have the pictures. They're just groovy cats to hang around because they know how it is. And they give you straight messages all the time. They're looking like looking into somebody's eyes who's finished. Just a pure mirror. And then you learn how to honor, to consecrate. You light some incense, and you might make the symbol of Aum three times. Just the symbol of Aum with the incense before these pictures. Now, what you're doing is you are honoring that place in all of us which is. You're honoring the place in yourself, the highest place in yourself. When you honor Ramana Maharshi, you're not honoring Sam Maharshi or Ramana Maharshi in the form of Ramana Maharshi. You're honoring the fact that he's a living statement of who we are. So that you honor, you honor, which is the offering, it's the offering, it's the, it's Doing from where you are in the illusion to that which is beyond the illusion. You're honoring gate, gate, paragate, parasama, again. And then you do your puja, and then you sit down, and then you start to center. And you may start out by doing your breathing. You might just meditate, just calm down, calm a little bit down, and then start to do your breathing. The, and then, and then and on and on. And then after that, maybe you'll do some asanas, some hatha yoga. Now, if you're going to do asanas, which you'll finally figure out, you've got to get your body straight because you'll see that you're spending most of your time doing this and this and this and this and this and, this and all this business, that you finally get pulled into getting your body straight with hatha yoga. And the thing about hatha yoga is it not only gets you so you can sit and pull your body out, but it opens, it's, when it's done right, it sensitizes you to a whole lot of nerves in your body that you can hear. You start to hear them and work with them. They're like radio receivers. And the third thing that asanas are is that they are mudras. They are statements again. That every mantra, like you go into a twist... And you get into it, and you sit up straight, and you turn your body, and you get into it as well as you can, and then you make the statement. You center perfectly, and you are in this position as if you were born this way. You are a piece of sculpture. You've never been any other way but this. And the minute you've centered in that place, then you're finished with that particular statement. And as you get more conscious, you will begin to feel how each, each asana, meaning seat in Hatha Yoga, each of the 84 asanas is a different kind of a statement. You'll start to experience the statementness, the nature of that statement when you make it each time. Okay. It's like calligraphy. And you do your asana slowly and consciously. You take each asana 
You go into it gently, you make the statement, you come out of it, you go into the next one. A, a good Hatha yogi can go through all 84 of them, just in, flip, out, in, flip, out, in, flip, out, and all the time is staying perfectly centered through it all. You finish your asanas, and then you meditate. Do rising and falling, or focus on something, and do that for 15 minutes, 30 minutes. Now, I'm giving you the maximum program, if you were going on a maximum program, then you might go do Tai Chi. Then you might take tea or take something in the morning, very light, very, very light. Tea would be enough. One meal a day is plenty. And then you would sit down and you might read like one of the writings of somebody who's made it. You might read the writings of Ramakrishna or Buddha or something like that. Don't read secondary sources. Read the straight stuff. Read the, the New Testament. Read the words of Jesus. Don't read the rest. Of, get the Bible where it's in red, where Jesus speaks, and read his words. Don't read all the rest of the drama. Read the Vedas, the Upanishads, the Gita, Philokalia, the... The Kabbalah, the, you know, on and on. There's lots of stuff you can read in that category. Don't read a lot, though. Everybody's collected enough. We've all been collecting, like, have you read this? Have you read? Did you read the Upanishad? <laughs> the Upanishads are not something you read like that. <laughs> See? The Upanishads are written in little uh, lines, which seem like a hang-up. If you're going to get through pages, man, you've got to go little line, little line, little line. But it's meant... Study in the Hindu system, in the yoga, is done by studying a shloka. You can take one of those little lines and just work with it. Just open any one, like I've got maybe six or eight holy books around me, sitting at my puja table, and I can close my eyes, pick any one, like the I Ching or the Tao or whatever it happens to be, pick it up, open it, look at the first line that hits my eye, read the line, close the book, put it away, and that's my study for the day. And then I study it. I go in that line and around it and over it and through it and I associate it to everything in my life and I just do it until I've done that line. Till I have become one with that line. That's study. Study is not collecting information. Study in this sense is ver vibrating with information till you become one with it. Now at Round 10 or 11, if you've got karma yoga to do, you do some karma yoga. You might have to clean up your room or brush something or do something. or And then at 11, you may prepare your food. All done with mantra. All done perfectly consciously. Very aware. Now, if you're doing the full treatment, at before you take the meal, you do your pranayama again. Your breath thing again. Then you take your food, you take your food silently by yourself. In fact, you stay silent all the time, except when you're singing holy songs or saying mantra. Take your food by yourself, eat it consciously. You learn how to consecrate your food, bless it, honor it. Part of the Divine Mother, feeding the Divine Mother to the Divine Mother. Be after your meal, you rest for a little while. And maybe there'll be a walk in nature or something like that. But do it consciously. It's not to go out and groove with nature. It's to be conscious of how it all is. So you keep the mantra going. Take a walk with mantra. And just look at it all and watch it all. Move very slowly. Or just sit down and meditate for another few hours. You can do it. I mean, I just ran a seminar in New Mexico uh, all fall up in Lama, New Mexico. We have a place 7,000 feet up. And we took seven little houses, and we they were A-frames or domes, and we insulated them and heated them, and then there were 19 of us, and then everybody would go into one of these houses for anywhere up to 19 days. Usually they'd go in for five days first, and then like 14 days or 10 days or something like that. that the house had in it a little wood stove, supply of wood, a bottle of water, Period. 
was completely cleaned out. You would walk in there, and I would be, I was a teacher, so I would determine what people would take in. So the first time I'd say, what would you like to take into the cabin? So they'd say, well, I'd like to take my sleeping bag, and say, groovy, and say, I'd like to take um, these books, and they'd make a list of books. Then I want to take my notebook so I can keep notes of what happens to me. I think that's wonderful. I'm going to take some candles. I'm going to take these holy pictures. Oh, that's all groovy. I think I'll take a little knitting or something, or I'll take, uh, I want to do some sketching. Uh, that's wonderful. And, you know, and I just let them do the whole thing for five days their way. And a lot would happen. A great deal would happen. And every day the food is brought at noon. A guy comes singing, singing holy songs so that you know somebody's coming, so there's no social interaction. If you have any messages to leave, you leave a little note outside the door saying, Send Ramdas. I was the only one that could come to visit them. Send Ramdas or water, and the bottle would be out there, and they'd get water or more firewood or something like that. And whatever you need, they were taken care of. And you were there for your five days or ten days. And if you could do it, you just sat. Because the next time, when it came for their second round, they'd say, uh, okay, I'm going in for the second time. I would say, all right, this time I'm going to control what you take in. Say, all right, what can I take in? I said, your sleeping bag. And they'd wait. They'd have their big bags full of stuff they were ready to take in. I'd say, you can store all that in my cabin. Yeah, but, well, do you want to do the thing or what's your game? I don't know. And then off they'd walk into a room for 10 days with their sleeping bag. Well, you can only be fascinated with making tea and with keeping yourself warm See, and walking around the room so many times, and you can only sleep so long. First, everybody goes into a long sleep thing. See, they sleep and sleep and sleep and sleep. <laughs> then you get tired of sleeping. Now, what are you going to do? See? You get up and it's getting dark and you're not sleepy. See? I mean, if you want to go on a horror trip, a horror trip, you climb the walls. What did I get myself into this thing for? I've got to get out of here. I got to remember. I just thought this important thing. I can't write it down. What do I do to remember it? See? No way to remember it. Either you got it or you don't got it. And by the end of the ten days, whoever comes out of that is really interesting. I'll tell you. <laughs> now some people freak and they can't make it. They're not ready to handle that, and they just come. Ah, you know. They suddenly you find them in the kitchen. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> <being away. laughs> And then people had the option of some of the people fasted for the full. Some people went in for 14 days with only their sleeping bag and didn't take any food. Right? Just had water delivered and wood. And the thing that when you do this is that you become awed by how much stuff your mind keeps creating. You really get a chance. See, if you go out and walk around nature, you get a whole lot of new stimulation. But if you just stay in this little wooden room, in your cell, in your monk's cell. It's interesting because when you first go and visit a monastery and see monk cells, you say, oh, these poor monks, they live so simply. Until you get, though, that all you crave is a monk's cell. First, you create a house for yourself. The first house is full of antiques and beautiful stuff and paintings and rugs and records and hi-fi and stuff like that. And then you notice that everywhere you move, you carry all this stuff like a huge turtle on your back. <laughs> and then pretty soon you notice that most of the stuff you're not using or listening to until pretty soon it gets lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter until all you really want is a little white room, see, with a mat on the floor to go in and sit down. And it blows your mind when you suddenly see how easy it could have been or it can be when you're ready for it. But you can't make believe you're ready when you're not ready. Because that's as phony, that's as phony as anything else. And if you go in and you sit in that room and all the time you're wishing you weren't in that room, you can outwish the, the room. Uh, you can beat the system. And what I dug in India was that I was only just so ready. That was all there was to it. That I could get just so far and then my attachments to worldly things kept catching me. I still had stuff to do in the world, and I couldn't make believe I was done because I wasn't done. So you go through your lunch and your resting and your further meditation, 
and then you might sing some holy songs and get yourself your emotions opened up through love and loving and loving and loving and loving and loving and loving and just keep opening your emotions through love. And then comes asanas again, hatha yoga, and then pranayama again. And then it's six o'clock and you meditate a little more and then you may make a little warm milk with some honey in it or a piece of fruit. And then you sit down and for change you meditate. And then it's time to lie down and you might lie down and then around midnight you get up and do pranayama again. Since you're sleeping flat on the floor, it's not hard. You keep waking up because you keep waking up every few minutes anyway. And then at 2.30 in the morning, you start the whole trip again. Very simple, not a big drama. That's the uh, maximum push program. The minimum push program is just to say, well, I'll just live my life, see? but I'll become... I'll watch myself live my life. That is, I'll use my, I'll become a witness of my own drama. Because it is true that to the extent that you can witness your own drama, your drama will change. It'll become more and more conscious. And that is called karma yoga, and just doing full-time karma yoga. There's no sense in doing, there's no sense in cutting a tree unless you can cut the tree consciously. There's no reason for it at all. No reason for that. There's no reason for washing a dish unless you can wash the dish consciously. Because all you're doing is increasing the illusion. And if all of this operation here at Cumbris is running exquisitely mechanically, so everybody's doing their part, but nobody's doing it consciously, it's just like some huge machine that is just mechanically driving itself on to its own extinction. Nothing's happening at all. And it's the ability to have that center or that witness or that third thing which is constantly here until you see that all the actions you're performing all day are just actions you're performing all day and that there is no attachment on your part to any one action over any other. If you want to examine what fatigue is, why you get tired, you'll find out you only get tired because of your own attachment. I can only get tired from sharing this stuff with you today if I care whether you hear it or not. If I'm attached to teaching you. In fact, all I can do is do what I do, what I do, what I do. And you will hear what you hear, what you hear, what you hear. <clears throat> Questions? Am I pushing everybody too hard? Is this too much? Yeah, don't you have to do a Isn't that part of the truth? You know that you get attached to some things and you... You do like them, and so you allow yourself to be attached to them, no matter what level they are. The statement, the requirement is, you must give it all up to have it all. Every attachment to any model at all must go in order to be able to have that thing. Say you love somebody. You're attached to somebody. You have to give up that attachment to them in order to really be with them. Because that attachment to them and the fear of losing them makes the, a, a limit to the relationship. And it's only when you can give up the attachment so that when you and that other person are together, we're just here now. And the next moment, if that person dies or is gone, well, that's a new moment. But if I sit now, because of my attachment, a fear of losing the attachment, or losing that thing I'm attached to, or trying to hold on to it, I'm in my thoughts and then I'm not here. Buddha's point is well taken. The cause of suffering is attachment. Now, that doesn't mean you have to give up stuff. You just have to give up the attachment to the stuff. You have to become so centered that whatever happens, however the cards are dealt, okay, that's how it is now. That's how it is now. And that allows you, when you're with something beautiful, to totally love it. 
because it's here and now, and this is it. <coughs> the next moment when it's gone, you can totally love this moment, too. See, the problem is, you don't give, it's finally, you don't give up loving, you just broaden it out so that you love it all. That's the way the process works. It's like, I used to try, I travel a lot, and I used to get it, I travel and then I feel, well, I'm going to go home now. It's an attachment to a model, I'm going home. Where are you while well, I'm away from home? And then I started to take these really fierce scenes, like I'd be sitting in an airline terminal. And I'd say, okay, where are you? And I'd say, well, you're home. Well, now, nobody makes an airline terminal a home. Everybody, characteristically, in an airline terminal is going somewhere or coming from somewhere or working there. But they don't call it home. Unless it's birds or something like that. And I'm sitting there, okay, I'm home. What is home? Home is a state of mind where you experience certain things. Relax, hear, open, I'm home. Well, I began to see that any time I thought I wasn't home, I was stuck in being less than here. So I'd be in the middle of Kansas and say, well, here I am. You know, you're in the middle of a long road that's going nowhere, coming from nowhere, and you're at marker 73. <laughs> home at last. <laughs> Very far up. You go through all of your lines you use about getting home, Keep using them until you begin to see that it's either all home or forget it. Because as long as you've got a model, you're attached. You're stuck. You're stuck. What happens when the universe stops being itself? Begin whatever. When the universe stops dreaming itself, nothing happens. The universe stops being. In other words, what would happen to all of this if there weren't anybody caught in the illusion? This wouldn't be, because this is the illusion. This is created by our desires. The minute your desires go, it's the end of it. People say, "Well, what would happen if people became enlightened? What would happen? Wouldn't <laughs> what would happen to society, civilization?" <laughs> well, that's the way it is. <laughs> Interesting. Now, maybe I haven't put it positively and beautifully enough. Maybe I haven't told you about how to love the Divine Mother enough. Because remember, attachments can be negative as well as positive. You can be so busy being attached to the white room that when the baby chirps or the bird sings or the nature does its thing, you say, oh, I wish it would stop. How can I meditate? That is as much attachment... You have to, in the Tibetan sense, you have to embrace your 10,000 beautiful, horrible demons and the 10,000 beautiful demons as well. The things you desire, you've got to let them pass. The things you don't, that repel you, you've got to accept. You've got to say yes and that too. Right and that too. Sure, right, that one too. The realized being says, one to me is loss and gain. One to me is fame and shame. One to me is pleasure and pain. One to me is life and death. That's the big one. The story you're all familiar with of the old monk who lives up in the monastery and the girl has a baby in the town and that she doesn't want to tell everybody it's the fisherman so she tells everybody it's the old monk people go up with torches and they knock on the gates of the monastery and they hand him the baby and they say you fathered this baby now you bring it up and he looks at it and he says ah so <laughs> and he takes the baby and he raises it and then many years later the girl is very sick and she's afraid of dying with this lie in her conscience so she tells everybody it was the fisherman that was the father and they go rushing up to the monastery and they Oh, we're terribly sorry. We've come to relieve you of the burden of rearing this child. And he looks and he says, Ah, so. However it is, it is. However it is, it is. Now, at any moment, as the cards are dealt, you play the hand as beautifully as you can. You play it with total involvement, with total compassion, and in the most harmonious way you know how. 
But no one hand is any better than any other hand. A hand is a hand is a hand is a hand. And when you find realized beings, you're as likely to find them walking around the country, running seminars, as you are as likely to find them being a postman or a garbage collector or a, or somebody you meet on the street that comes from who knows where and goes who knows where. Who knows where. That there's no external model and form of what holy men are like. And all if you read the book, The Perfect Master of Mayababa, the way he went around, uh, or uh, the wayfarer, about how he went around taking care of the mosques. And he would find these men who were sitting in garbage dumps. And all they were, they were in charge of the spiritual vibrations of an entire area. And all they did was sit there all the time. And you'd come and you'd see a guy sitting in the garbage dump and you'd say, well, what could he be about? Mayabob would rush over and he'd wash him and he'd take care of him and leave him sitting in the garbage dump because that was his thing. We keep trying to measure it all in external... Are we doing important work? Doing important work in your life? Doing something really meaningful? Whatever you do, you do it consciously and you are doing the optimum thing at that moment. If you walk into a grocery store and you're in such a rush to get home to meditate that when you get to the cashier's desk, you get frustrated with her because she's holding you up and therefore you send forth a vibration of anger which makes her tighter, you just create a new karma that, boy... The game is to not create new karma and then just finish off the old karma. And you don't create new karma when you perform every act without attachment. Do what you do, but do it without attachment, and then there's no new karma created. Ever. I guess I don't think on dimensions like that. The word achieved has in it a, con a continuum of wise and not wise. All I am is where I am at. I am where I am, and I am what I am. And if what I am is wise to you, groovy. I am what I am. I don't know where I am. And I don't even really care where I am. That's the thing. So I, don't, I don't think about the question of the answer. I could say if I wanted to answer yes, and then again, no. Because obviously I'm a beginner on the path and I don't understand a great deal of stuff. And at the same time, I know much more than I ever knew before. I feel more about how it is. The less I think, the wiser I get, I notice. Which blows my mind, having been a scientist. <laughs> That's really a hard one for me. That's really a hard one. How do you compare what you're talking about with psychotherapy? Psychotherapy is just as high as the therapist is. If you have as your therapist Buddha, the likelihood is you can become enlightened through psychotherapy. Psychotherapy is a human encounter between two beings, and any encounter between two beings will be as high as whoever the highest being is in the encounter. And to the extent that the therapist is not identified with being a therapist, the patient can get free of being a patient. To the extent that the therapist is not identified with doing good, the patient can get free of somebody to whom good has to be done. To the extent that the therapist meets the patient as, here we are human beings in the roles of doctor and patient, to that extent everybody gets free. And recently I went to the heroin addiction center at the Boston State Hospital for an afternoon with Danny and... Uh, Bob Taylor was there too. And 
I, it blew my mind. There were 50 people in the room, of which uh, some are heroin addicts and some are doctors and some are social workers and nurses. And it was very clear to me that the doctors were more addicted to their addiction, which was to being doctors, than the heroin addicts were even to their addiction. Because when I sat down in the room and we closed the door, as far as I'm concerned, there's 50 beings in a room and here we are, now what? And let's cut out all the crap of roles and who's going to do what, and doctors and I'm sick and I need help and all that stuff. It's all melodrama and here we are, now here we are. And you look at another human being and say, here we are, and they, here, they acknowledge it. And the doctors are saying, well now, and you can't, they, they, they just, they got these cards in their hand and they want to hold on. Because they're enjoying the power. It's an ego trip. It's just very poignant. They're busy doing good, and they've got to have somebody to do good to. Yeah. I think that, that there are people that come to see me who come in and say, I am confused. They say, I am sexually this. I am aggressive. I am this. I am that. And all I can do to maximally help them is work on myself by keeping my center. And if I can keep my center, oh man ne ped me hung, oh man ne ped me hung, oh man ne ped me hung, as fast as they say any of those things, they get free of them because they keep noticing that behind that, here we are. And the person comes in and I says, I got this terrible problem and I don't know where to turn. And they, like a woman comes to see me. I may have told this last time I was here at Cumbris. A woman came to see me and she tells me her child's taking drugs and She's worked all her life for her child, and now the child's run away and forged a check, and boy, she's got a really sad story. And she takes about 15 minutes to tell it, and she, I don't know why I've come to see you, but I, it's a last desperate effort, and, right? And all the time I'm doing, oh, my Nathan, you know, oh, my Nathan. And she gets all done with this whole thing, not looking at me, of course, at all during it. And then she looks, and I'm sitting right here. Now, the, that isn't lack of compassion. The most compassionate thing I can do for her is not get sucked into the melodrama she's just laid on me. And what I, in effect, say is, you are, you're absolutely right, all that's true, and here we are. Now what? Because behind you being a mother whose daughter's run away and all that, I just met you and you're a human being, and I'm a human being. Now what do we do from here? And within just moments after she feels the freedom that comes from that, because everybody else, she's so good at it, and it's such a poignant story, she just takes everybody with her all the time. You know, any doctor would want to help her. See? And what happens is immediately she starts, the smile comes in, and she starts to say, well, I was actually kind of a hellion when I was a child, too. You know that next level of the dance. And she goes through that whole level of the dance. And she's saying, and I don't know why I've come to see you. I certainly feel wonderful, but that's all silly. I, you know, terrible thing that I, you know, same moment. Now, she can't maintain it. Within an hour after she leaves, she'll be right back in the drama. And that is a karmic problem. And you cannot, you can't do anything to another human being. You can only provide the environment where if they are ready to grow, they will grow. And the whole thing of psychotherapy is what I would call creeping professionalism is that one human being thinks they're going to do something to another human being, which is merely a trap they are stuck in. Because it is really, doctor, cure thyself. That's really what the requirement is. And if I were training psychotherapists, as I used to do in the old days, instead of teaching them the Kreplonian, Kreplinian system of psychodynamic <laughs> you know, categories and doing the MMPI and the Rorschach, I would teach them how to center and meditate because it's almost a universal. You want to be a better truck driver? You want to be a better therapist? You want to be a better mother? You want to be a better lawyer? You want to be a better holy man? You want to be a better dishwasher? You want to be a better thief? You want to be a better whatever your game is, become centered, become conscious. Okay? It's as simple as that. Right. <laughs> What do you do, though, if you a very, very angry person who acts out physically? Is it patient? Well, um, an angry person who acts out. Well, I think I told a story here once when I was here about somebody who beat me up. Huh? I was a 
I told her Arlington Street Church. Well, I'll run through it very briefly to give you that the flavor of it without the whole thing. I was invited out to uh, Esalen to be in residence, and uh, all this is public information, so there's no thing here. And these were around my neck, and I was playing the tambour and singing love songs to Ram. And up drives a car, and this somebody's brought this raving maniac to see me, to be cured, see. And he gets out of the car and he comes menacingly towards me and I think, wow, he's really flipped out, you know. But music must cure the savage beast, so I'm playing to make one horse. And he goes and he sits behind me. And the first thing I feel is this crack in my head. Right? Wow, that's a strange way to express love. <laughs> and I'm confused, and I keep playing my tambour. And then the next thing is I feel another crack in my head this way. And I, oh, wow, my brains are all shaking. And I'm just... <laughs> next thing is I feel a kick in my ribs. Oh, wow, man, this is just too far out, you know. Now, the first reaction I'm experiencing is confusion. Okay, because my model's been upset because he, this guy's a friend of mine. He and I like each other, and suddenly he's acting out aggressive. All right, in your category. He then walks around. He picks up the tumbler and he throws it. All right, and I hear it land on a rock, and a big hole goes into the drum. And I, oh boy, there goes the tumbler. Wow, <laughs> there goes. Imagine that. <laughs> And then he picks up the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna and he throws that over the side. And I think, uh oh, shouldn't have done that. You know? <laughs> I mean, he screw around with me because obviously I'm a lousy tambura player, but don't fool around with Ramakrishna. I mean, he's really something, you know. Tough, baby, that's a bad thing to do. So. And then he gets me down and he's got his my beard in one hand and he's got his, his thumb in my neck. I can't talk, see, and he's got his hip in my ribs, and I'm looking at him like, oh, wow, he's so nice. All the time, my thoughts are, I'm wondering, I wonder if the beard rips off, or the whole chin rips off, or the neck breaks, or what do you suppose happens first? You know, nothing more than just like, wow, isn't this far out, see? And uh, so then he gets up and I stand up and he takes these beard, beads and he rips them. And he's holding a section about this long that had been broken so there was a string tied in them and he's got them in his hand and the rest of the beads are falling off. Now these are the beads my guru gave me and like the hell with everything else, man, I want those beads. See, so. I'm picking up the beads, he's kicking me, and I don't care. I'm just, like getting the beads, and I get the beads, and I take the what's left of the necklace, and I throw it into the house where he can't get at it. And he takes the other beads, and he puts them in his pocket. And these beads have disappeared, these other Buddhist beads. And then he goes, and he gets in the car to leave, and I, he says, get me out of here. It's you against me. They've taken you over. And all the time I'm saying, wow, maybe they have. <laughs> I'm like, sure, I'll go you, Chip. Wow. Then I walk over to him and I say, hey, baby, I really want those beads. Because I see my desire. I'm attached to those beads. All 107 of them. <laughs> that time. He says, you want them? And he takes them and he throws them. And then he gets out of the car and he comes at me and I see them land in white flowers. And just as I see the white flowerness, he starts to hit me. Now, I've gone through all of my... See, I've never been beaten up since I've become a holy man. <laughs> I don't know what you feel like when you get beaten up and you're a holy man. You know? And so, you know, a holy man... Some holy men sit there and everybody kills them and other holy men fight back and they're samurais. How do I know what a holy man's supposed to do? I don't have a book for the you know, instructions for being beaten up when you're a holy man. You know? So I'm, I'm playing it by ear. See, I'm keeping the mantra going and I'm like very confused because what am I supposed to do? I don't know. I'm not supposed to do anything, I guess. And it's like, wow, ooh, you know. And then I dig I'm attached to the beads, and then I dig that the bead situation's all over, how it came out. The beads are all over. And then suddenly I feel absolutely free, and I suddenly feel this total love for him. And the minute I feel love for him, I beat the hell out of him. <laughs> and I 
push him over and I get him down and I'm sitting on top of him and I'm right on top of him and all the time I'm whispering in his ear, I love you. It's all straight. At which point, he picks me up and he sends me flying, so my head goes through a bag of rabbit food, a huge <laughs> bag of rabbit food, and he gets in the car and drives away. So this all takes about four minutes. And I sit down and I think, wow, that's very far out, you know. And uh, the denouement, a, a, a panel truck pulls up with some backwoods hippies from Big Sur, than which there are no more backwoodsian. They're like Ozarkian hippies, you know. They all, all the chicks wear long dresses and they look like they eat nails and the guys all have their teeth missing and they wear hats pulled way down over their heads and they're really tough, you know. They're, they're gentle. They're like the Atlas tire ads, you know. They're tough but oh so gentle. And uh, they come in and they, they find the tomboy and one of them says, hey, baby, you shouldn't treat your tomboy like that. <laughs> and I'm just watching this all. This is like drama. <laughs> Now the guy brings back the Ramakrishna book and sets it down. And, and then the guy says, can I work on the tumbler? I said, well, it's broken. I don't care. It's all gone. He takes it away. They leave. I look for the beads. Can't find the rest of the beads. All night, these beads are lost. All night long, I'm up. All night, my beads are gone. God, what am I going to tell the guru? Well, I'll tell him a madman came out of the jungle and ripped my beads. And, you know, I'm trying to think of how to spill the story. I've blown my scene. You know, <laughs> my ego's really involved. Finally, I figure out. Finally, well, the beads are gone. That's the way it is. And I walk outside and walk over to white flowers, and there are the beads hanging over the white flowers. I bring them in. I lay them all out. I count 108 beads. See. Two days later, the truck drives back. Out comes the tambour. You can't even tell where it's been broken. They've like done it with plastic something or other, in alchemical fashion, and so it's all perfect. I'm doing asanas, and I put my hand between two boards, and there are these beads. The black and blue marks go away, and I write the guy a letter, and I say, thank you, you're a great teacher. And when people said to me, why did he hit you? I'd say, because I wasn't pure enough. Because there was a thought form in my head, I'll play the music which will calm him down. See, I was attached. And that attachment is what he hit. If I were not attached, he wouldn't have hit me. Because that's what's called the shield of Buddha. And the shield of Buddha is your pure non-attachment. And so he was teaching me. He was, he was very... Yeah. It's a fierce teaching, but it was a teaching. And if you read uh, Milarepa, the life of Milarepa, and you see how uh, his teacher would say, all right, build this triangular house. And the guy would build it, and he'd say, all right, now tear it down. I decided I was drunk when I told you to build the triangular house. I want a square house. So Miller Rep, months, would work, and his sores in his back, and he, was, and he kept saying, please enlighten me. And the guy says, as soon as you build a five-sided house, but I just built a four-sided, well, tear it all down. That was, you, you didn't hear me, right? I said five-sided. The guy says, no, you said four-sided. He says, I said five. Miller Rep says, well, this time I'll have your wife as a witness. So he says, say it again. He says, build a five-sided house. So then he gets all done and he says, I'm sure I said a six-sided house. And he says, but your wife said, and the wife said, yes, you said a five-sided house. He says, shut up, woman. And you, what are you, questioning me and over my wife? Get away. And he throws him out. Poor guy goes through all this hell because of his attachments all the time. And the teacher is just taking them through thing after thing after thing after thing. So, it was like yesterday, a Brandeis student came to see me, and um, we sat looking into one another's eyes, and we went through a lot of stuff until pretty soon you could feel a tremendous amount of tension mounting in him because there were blocks and stuff like that. And finally, he said, I've got to move. And he got up and he started to do the sun exercise like he was going to go through the roof, you know. <laughs> you know, like, very fierce, you know. And I just sat there doing all Monday, and me. Wow, did that. I mean, unbelievable scene. He sat down and he looked at me like, well, now that's over. And all I 
said was, well, maybe soon you'll learn how to transmute energy. Because what's happened is, as you and I got closer and closer, you, we got into a higher and higher space, and this higher space, we both got more energy. And the problem is, you don't have any way to express that energy in compassionate terms without doing a more profane take. If he were to hug me, he would feel like he was seducing me. He would feel we were entering into a homosexual contract. If he were to do, if he were to express something, he would feel it was an ego manifestation. He was blocked because he couldn't, he couldn't serve. It was like the Wesleyan student the other night I was telling you about, Zaria, who, who, um, spends the whole evening in the, t in the church where we get very high together and he walks out into the stars and he looks at the stars and the spirit just inundates him and he just comes into the spirit and his next reaction is a feeling of embarrassment because at the lower level of his head he can't handle this higher experience without interpreting it I must be getting soft in the head because I know I don't believe in the spirit And all you can do is keep centering, it's keep centering, and keep centering yourself. Because I can free the guy from being bound as long as I'm not bound in his profane take. What would you say about, about movements for social change on a large scale? Kind of movements for social change. You move in the United States, which both sides are tremendously attached. Yeah, it, in terms of the activist scene at the moment, um, it strikes me that um, <laughs> that um, there has been much more energy liberated in the culture than was ever available before, primarily because m the culture is forcing people to come into the here and now. Television, transportation, everything forces that. And as that happens, people get more and more energy as they come into the here and now more. And they have their old models of what to do, which is external freedom models. Like if you make it externally beautiful, it'll be internally beautiful. That's an old model. And therefore, they get into doing the thing to get the external freedom harder and harder and harder with more and more energy. So that... When they do that, though, they still do it in the idea of good and evil, that there is the other side, which they don't empathize with, so that they're, it's we against them. And the minute they do a we against them, if it's the ecologists versus the, the polluters, if it's the blacks versus the segregationists, if it's the hippies versus the establishment, whatever it is, it's like a polarization that they get caught in. They get caught in the yin-yang of it. See? whether it's male, female, or whatever it is, they get caught in yin and yang. And they, as a result, create the polarity more and more, because as long as they're attached to one side, they create the opposite. Now, to the extent that a person is conscious, they can make a statement for ecology by their way of living, which is ecologically harmonious, and they can make a statement to another person about ecology which doesn't create in the other person a feeling of distance. In other words, if I see you as him, when I talk to you, all I'm creating in you is more of a feeling of isolation from me, which is forcing you to see me as him. The minute, however, I see you as us, then you and I can talk about the ecological problem, no matter who you are, whether you're the president of the worst smog-creating machine in the world. Now, my further feeling is that we are gathering in larger and larger numbers in order, it's a method for getting high, or coming into the light, like Woodstock and gatherings, which are social political statements, but they are social political statements incidental to the fact that they get people high. Like hundreds of thousands of people are planning to go to Toronto in July, which will be another Woodstock, it appears to be evolving into. And it'll be... Uh, It'll be for peace, and it'll be for ecology, it'll be for all good things and against all bad things, okay? <laughs> the fact of the matter is that people that are gathering there are gathering there to feel that experience of uh, whatever that experience is. There is a place where we get to the point where we don't need to do that anymore because that experience is happening inside of ourselves. 
And it seems to me that beings and so on, which have tremendous social political overlay, become somewhat of anachronistic. They become, they start, a, you sort of get done with them. Now, take P war, war and peace in Vietnam. There is no doubt, it's just like Malcolm X said to Martin Luther King, we need each other. I don't question that the violence forces the hand of the administration to respect and to listen to do things. But at the same moment, if you look in, in Berkeley or in California now, it's very hard not to do a 1934 Germany take of the fascistic element of the police with their, their helmets and boots and guns and long sticks or in Boston last the other day. And you begin to see how that method of behavior change is creating very horrible side effect. Very horrible side effect. The profound model of behavior change is just like with psychotherapy. Change yourself first. Work on yourself. Because if you walk down the street and you are a loving person, a peaceful person, Every act you perform with another human being increases the feeling in them of lovingness and peace. That's all there is. It's the only way it can work. Okay. And that in turn increases their loving and peacefulness, which in turn affects the next person. It's, there's the old story, the other way it works, where you yell at somebody, he goes home, and he, he hits his wife, who beats the kid, who kicks the dog, my father brought the tuzism, or whatever the thing is. It's a, it's a, but it's a story of the, the spin-off. Well, the spin-off works the other way, the same way. And the thing is, if you want to live in light, the first thing you got to do is become light. When you be light, then you live in light. If you don't be light, you don't live in light. You can't be dark and say, why aren't you giving me light? It doesn't work that way. So, I keep meeting more and more people, more and more young people especially, who tell me about they are getting despairing of the political movements. I'm even starting to meet a few blacks who are saying that now. Because they're beginning to see that they don't want what it is they get that way. And then you're beginning to see that You've got to be what it is you want to create in the universe. And there, it's an amazing thing how when a number of beings become a certain way, a whole process changes. I'm telling you, don't underestimate the power of the spirit. But the spirit doesn't have to be measured in numbers or in external action. The spirit has to be measured in the nature of the beings of the, be of the people. It was the nature of the beings of the people in Germany that allowed a certain process to happen. And it's the nature of the beings that we are that allow processes to happen. And when you become a different being, the whole thing around you keeps changing. All the time. I can watch a bus driver who's a beautifully centered person, and people get on his bus, and they get off his bus, and just in the time they gave him the quarter, and they were riding his bus, they created, he created a vibration in them, which just makes their whole thing just a little bit softer. And how many, a little bit softer, a little bit softer, a little bit softer, before, here we all are. <coughs> Turns out, whatever your role in life, you can do it right in the role you are. You don't have to go out and wave your hands and say, I'm for peace. <coughs> you just have to be peaceful. And then that process starts to happen. And people say, well, it isn't enough. But that is the maximum thing a human being can do, is increase the degree of consciousness. Because in a conscious civilization, like war is a relatively unconscious act, except if it's a game played among uh, mercenaries, then it's just a high game, like chess. For mercenaries that believe in reincarnation, war is just like any other game. It's neither good nor bad, it's just another game. Am I cutting into Tai Chi time? Yes, it's three minutes past five.
I think we bow until <laughs> is is uh, is eight o'clock all right? Is that sure. Eight? Is that too early? Uh, huh? Eight thirty. We'd rather have eight thirty for some reason that known only to you. All right, eight thirty. We are. Huh? Let it be your Eight thirty is my time. <laughs> eight thirty. We're here. Is this now? Is the structure of the evening something different than the structure now? I'd like us to do some singing and, uh, you know, just try to open our bodies and stuff into the harmony together a little bit. But let's do it only as we feel it. Let's not phony, you know. Right? If we can do it, we can do it. If we can't, we can't. So get drunk on Tai Chi, <laughs> and which is outdoors now with Master Leon, and then we'll be here at 8:30. When I was in India, I started collecting quotes, and I've been collecting books full of them. And um, then when I'd speak each place, give darshan, I'd always surround myself with these quotes, and I'd keep picking them up and saying, as Buddha said, as Christ said, as... And then, as I started to realize that if I could just center and clear my head of having to do anything, that out would come out of me, since I was reading these all the time and living in them, would come out those thoughts. And that I didn't have to use the as Buddha said or as Christ said to have it come out. All I had to do was center and let myself just be a vehicle for stuff to come through. And then it all became more natural and more in harmony with what it was everybody needed at that moment. Um, but one quote that I've sort of clung to is this quote which I read when I was here last time, which is a quote from Meher Baba, one of the five or six that I still keep using. Because it seems like an ideal introduction into what bhakti yoga is about, or the yoga of love or devotion, which is is often said to be the appropriate yoga for the Kali Yuga, or the period of darkness. It's the method of the heart. Um, Maya Baba says, Love has to spring spontaneously from within. It is in no way amenable to any form of inner or outer force. Love and coercion can never go together. But though love cannot be forced on anyone, it can be awakened in him through love itself. Love is essentially self-communicative. Those who do not have it catch it from those who have it. True love is unconquerable and irresistible. And it goes on gathering power and spreading itself until eventually it transforms everyone whom it touches. To see where love fits into the scheme of things in relation to consciousness, which we've been talking about most of the day, you have got to have wrestled with and come to a deep understanding of the statement that love and consciousness are an identity. That is, they are exactly the same thing. And if you want to take it one step further out, love 
consciousness and energy are an identity. Right? In fact, at that top of that pyramid, where all of the stuff comes together into the oneness, love, if you follow it far enough back, energy, consciousness, truth, beauty, it's all the same thing. They're just different perspectives, different emphasis of the initial statement, which is unsta unstatable. Now, when you open the fourth chakra, you experience more energy, and that is done, and the experience is one of greater and greater love for all things, all things, a compassionate love. Now, it is useful to get free of of thinking of love as a finite commodity or as out of the romantic models of interpersonal love. It may be that we'd be better off to get rid of all the words that we've overused, like love and consciousness and energy, but since we are working with them, because they do show emphasis, start to understand the difference between what would be called Christ love or that profound love of the beingness and the doing love of I love you. Now, if you understand that love is a state of existence, it's a state, it's a vibrational place, it's a psychic space. And when you say we are in love means that you and I do that thing to each other which allows us to come into that psychic space. In other words, you really say, my beloved turns me on, which means touches a place in me where I am, love. That's really a better way of saying it. Okay. You allow me to be love is what you're really saying to somebody that you say, I, you, you know, I love you. When I say I love you, it means that you allow me to be, be love, okay. which is a more exact way of saying it. You turn me on to that place in me where I am love. And if you start to see that as you transcend, you notice that when you are in love, you are as much concerned with the well-being of your beloved as yourself. And if they haven't eaten, you don't feel like eating. And, you know, you're really, there's that place where you, where you share karma, if you will. You merge with that other person and their problem is your problem. You don't decide whether it'll be their, your problem. It is your problem because you've merged in that way. Well, in that sense, you have both entered into a shared psychic space, which is uh, uh, what happens the minute you can transcend the boundaries of your own individual separate identity. Okay. Now, It's useful to think of this, I think, as, as frequencies of vibrations. I think it works quite well that way. That if, if I am in love, that feeling when you're in love with life or another person or nature or spring or whatever that thing is where you're dancing inside and bubbling over and the whole thing is new and fresh and beautiful, that place, that you can think of as a frequency a vibration in which you are perceiving. It's like a, a field, a way in which you are seeing the universe, and it's all vibrational. It's just like color spectrum. At different vibrations, you see different colors. Well, in different vibrations, <coughs> you see different realities in the same way, in a more profound level. So then the question, as Maya Baba says, is, since that higher vibration, the game is to get identified with higher and higher vibrational rates. In other words, do your take of yourself through these higher rates until finally you get to the point where you are light and you merge with light, which is the highest vibrational rate while where stuff stays separate from one another. Anything beyond Planck's constant, it's a different matter entirely. It's, it's the other side of the coin.
So now when you want to change your own vibrational rate, the, one of the games to do it with is to calm the mind down till you get free of all of the thought patterns that keep you stuck at this vibrational <coughs> frequency, this channel. Another way of doing it, which is the bhakti yoga way, which is within dualism, is to pick some, some entity to which, which is exuding love by its nature, or light, or love, light, life, etc., and then just keep opening yourself to it by this process. In other words, you pull yourself into its vibrational field by surrendering to its vibrational rate. And the reason you can do it is because it's perfectly safe. Okay, it's perfectly safe. Now, see, Maya Baba, for example, says, all you've got to do, he says, if you want to go the whole trip, all you've got to do is love me. Sounds like a far-out egomaniac. You know? Just love me enough, and you'll become enlightened. But what he's saying is, through your ability to love me, you will tune in on the place in you which is love, and that place is the same place as full consciousness. And that's what enlightenment is, where you become one with love. You are love, you are light, you are energy, you are consciousness. It's, it's the place where every movement you make is the totally creative act, because you can't do anything but that, because you're always performing the optimum act in any situation. Now, this method of bhakti yoga can be done in about ten different ways, depending on which way you get turned on. Okay? Like there are bhakti yogic forms for loving, loving the light in the form of a woman. There's some for loving it in the form of a man. There's some for loving it in the form of a child. There's some for loving it in the form of, of um, uh, a teacher or a master. Uh, each person finds that form through which they can express love openly. Now, in our Western religious traditions, we only really think of God or that thing within a certain very limited set of possibilities. And God is often characterized as either being righteous or wrathful or forgiving. He's a little bit like somebody's stern grandfather, oftentimes. The... the the de in the in sometimes in the psalms and the songs you see the other side, but generally the he's he's you can't imagine him um, in wild sexual sport by the banks of the Jumna somehow like you can with Krishna, because Krishna is spending a whole every autumn autumn on the full moon, Krishna plays his flute. He's the eternally youthful, beautiful young boy. He plays his flute and all the chicks in the countryside drop whatever they're doing. They leave their babies, their husbands, their milk buckets, everything. When Krishna plays the flute, they come and they come to see him and it's a full moon by the riverbank and 16,000 of these gopis or goat, uh, goat girls, these uh, milkmaids, come and stand around just loving him and then in order to fulfill their greatest desire he makes himself manifest in 16,000 forms and he makes love to each of them just the way they want to be made love to. All right? And in that wild moment they become one with Krishna and they become the divine. They become divine at that moment. Now that story which is a traditional story in India is a very hard one for us in the West to think about in religious terms see? and many Indians sit around pundits say around is this uh, is this uh, pornographic or is it you know because once the spirits lost man you know what everybody does with their heads <laughs> but it turns out that there is a sect in India called the Shaks who are who are who become the gopis in order to love Krishna that way. And they literally, they're men, and they're not transvestites in the, in the second chakra sense, but they dress like gopis, and they go around, and their whole sect is designed to worship Krishna. And they worship Krishna in the relation of lover and beloved. And through that relationship, which is the highest form of bhakti yoga, it turns out, see, that lover to the beloved, 
you then go through the door of dualism into non-dualism. Now, the sect that I'm in is a servant sect, and the model of their service is Hanuman, the monkey. Because in the Ramayana, in the story of Ram, Ram is this beautiful young prince, and he's he's a perfect karma yogi. That's who he is. He's a perfect father, husband, warrior, prince, uh, everything. He gets sent off into the jungle, and is and he's a perfect jungle person. He he does everything perfectly. He's always perfectly conscious. He's just a good guy, right? His name is Ram. Okay, now. Just like most of these holy books, <laughs> like, he doesn't mind, sir. Just like most of these holy books, there are always at two levels. That is, see, like in the, in the New Testament, there is, of course, the Jesus story and the Christ story. See, there is Jesus saying, like, like doing his thing every day, and then there is Christ who's giving the asides to the audience. See, like in a Shakespeare play, saying, Tomorrow's the big day, or, you know, now it's all done, or, you know, now the story's lived out, or that's according to the prophecy, you see, there's, there's that meta guy, meta think, who sees it all, see, and in most of the holy books, there are always those two levels, you see, you always have, it's that you take it at whatever level you can take it at, so that there is always a nice story, like the Ramayana, see, but you get a clue to how the two levels, like in the Ramayana, Ravan is the bad guy, but he's actually a good guy taking a bad incarnation in order to finish off some rough karma, okay? And his greatest hope is he'll be killed by Ram, who is his enemy, see, because that will free him and finish him with his trip. So it's a, he's a bad guy on one level and he's a good guy on another level. At one point, Ram is walking through the woods and the gopis, uh, not the gopis, the... Um, the um, Nagas, the naked ascetics, are being bugged by demons. It's a great story I like. They're being bugged by demons, and and Ram, they come to Ram and they say, "Hey Ram, would you get rid of these demons, man? They're a real drag, and we can't meditate and get on with our sadhana. See, it's like, would you clear up the scene of the town so it's cool, so we don't, you know, because the police are coming. It's a real drag." So, so Ram says, "Well, I'll have to go see my guru to get a, a mantra to do it, you know." So he walks through, you know, swamp and bush to finally get to his guru, and his guru takes one look and sees Ram coming, who's God, of course, right, at one level. And the guru goes rushing out of the house and falls on his face before Ram, and Ram sees his guru, and there's his guru, and Ram is still the young guy, and there's his guru, and he goes and falls on his face, and they're falling on their face in front of each other. And Ram says to the guru, I need a mantra to get rid of the <coughs> demons that are bugging the Nagas. Uh, I'm translating it slightly. Uh, and the guru says, uh, sure, man, I'll give it to you. And then he says, hey, wait a minute, baby. Like, you're God. What kind of a thing? What are you asking me for the mantra for? You're not only the mantra, but you're the demons. You're the whole business, man. If you don't like it, just change. You know, it's your thing. <laughs> And then right in the middle of putting Ram down for coming on to him, he says, oh, I forgot, we're in an incarnation, and in this incarnation, you're this young cat, and I'm your guru, so of course I'll give you a mantra here. Here's your mantra, go do your thing. See? See? Now, that's what, why it's very high reading these books, because, see, you're getting these levels, and you begin to see your own drama lived out at all these levels as well. And you begin to see that everybody you're meeting is Ram, in some form or other that's come or is that same being in some form or other and so in india when you meet people you always say namaste which when it was known in the spirit and used in the spirit it meant i honor that place in you which is behind all your dramas i honor the atman i honor the light the god within you right and now hanuman uh at, to get to hanuman uh, at one point um Sita, who's, who's Ram's wife, is taken away by Ravana, who wants to make it with her, because she's a beautiful chick, see? And he takes her to his island, and she won't make it with him. She says, I'll die first. I only want Ram. And, of course, Ram is distraught, because his chick's gone, but at the same level, uh, he's God, and, you know, how distraught can he get? Because, right, all right, so there's two levels. 
But in the level at which he's distraught, he goes rushing around looking for Sita, and he goes to the king of the monkeys, and he says, hey, you fellows are around everywhere, you know, in the trees looking. Uh, would you help me find Sita? And the king, who Ram does a few favors for, and the king, and so on, the king says, I'll assign my monkey lieutenant to your service. And the monkey lieutenant is Hanuman. And Hanuman dedicates his life to serving Ram. And Hanuman in the pictures is always shown kneeling on one knee, touching Ram's feet. That's the, the relationship of Hanuman to Ram. And Hanuman is, now dig this way it works, you see, that Hanuman is just a regular old monkey. However, to the extent that his service to Ram is pure, he develops, he has all the powers of God. Right? That's the way the thing works. In other words, he su surrenders himself to pure light and pure energy, becoming therefore a conduit, and since he surrendered himself, it is a conduit of ex increasing expanded diameter through which all the energy can pass. To understand that more clearly, take my guru, who is a, in, in this Hanuman sect. He spends his whole life, just the way Hanuman does, open to Ram. He is in love with Ram. He is loving upward. In the, in the Hindu system, there's only one male in the universe, by the way, and it's God. And everything else in relation to it, in this particular model, is female open. You see, And he surrenders to that, so he becomes upward. He is female. That is in the yan yin, yin yin yang sense of it. He is the passive, receptive, open. Because of the purity of his surrender, all of the energy of Ram passes through him. So that anybody that meets the guru experiences the fact that they are meeting the most powerful male being they've ever met. Not in the Western male, masculine thing, but the maleness of the force field, that force. So when you meet this pure force, the first thing you want to do is surrender to it. And you open yourself and surrender to it, and to the extent that your surrender is pure, all the energy goes through you, and then you in turn are this strong, etc., which in turn leads the next person to open to you, which allows the energy to go through, and that's the way the baraka, or the spirit, is passed. It's passed through the act of surrender, which in can be from the lover to the beloved or the servant to the master. And Hanuman's role is the servant to the master. So that, um, like I sit in India in a temple, and there is a, in front of me an eight-foot-high statue of a monkey. Right? And I sit there meditating in front of this monkey, and I think about the folks back home. <laughs> 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 Good Jewish boy from Boston sitting in front of this monkey up in the mountain, you know, worshiping a monkey. It's a hard one to explain. It's just, uh, that you're not worshiping idols. <laughs> and Hanuman says, Ram says to Hanuman, Hanuman, Ram says to Hanuman, Hanuman, who are you? And Hanuman says, when I don't know who I am, I serve you. When I know who I am, you and I are one. Right? Got that? In other words, when I've awakened to who I really am, there is no difference between us. But as the minute I come down into dualism, the only role I come down into in dualism is to serve you. That's the only thing I do in the world of dualism. And therefore, every act I perform is an act of service to you. Right? And that's the way you can open your conduit to the widest possible diameter for the maximum amount of psychic energy which allows you to be optimally effective in the universe at any moment, is to surrender yourself to, which is in the Christian Bible, not my but thy will, O Lord, which is that same exact statement. So... It can be like John to Jesus, friend to friend, it can be brothers, it can be all these different relationships. Each person finds their own relationship to relate to. Now, the thing is, you can take your beloved, another person, and do the same thing by going deeper and deeper, but it's a very, very, very risky upaya. It is the highest risk upaya, as I can see, 
is using you a sexual partner or a lover on the physical plane who isn't a realized being as your method of going into higher consciousness because when you're dealing with areas that are high drive areas, the habits, the mechanical habits are you learn, you learn under very high drive and they're very difficult to change. And it's very difficult not to get caught in loving the wrong level in the other person. Or not loving the individual difference level. The, instead of that which is behind it, the light, the pure light in the other person. And so sometimes it is useful to go back and forth. There is a mantra, which is a mantra I will uh, write out for those of you that want, and we, I entitle to you, is, the one is Aditya Hridayam Punyam Sav Shatru Bina Shanam, which comes from the Ramayana, which says, all evil vanishes from life for him who keeps the sun in his heart. And I can sit there and just walk down the street, Aditya Hridayam Punyam Sav Shatru Bina Shanam. And all I do is I become like the sun. What does the sun do? It emits light, it emits warmth, it emits life force. It asks nothing in return. It doesn't say, I love you, I'll shine on you because you are good and I won't shine on you because you are bad. It just shines. It does its thing. It doesn't ask anything in return. And the result is that everybody that comes into its orb, its scope, its, its area, is warmed and given life and given everything, given energy. And that's what you become. You become an unconditional lover. As C.S. Lewis says, I don't think I can find the quote exactly, he says, love me because I am totally superfluous. Neither love me because of my need or your desire, but just because. Just love me because you love me, because you love me, because you love me, because you are love, because that's what you do, you love. Now, when we sing uh, Kirtan, which is the repeated names of God, it isn't just to sing repeated names of God, it's to open that possibility of love. It's to, you can do it to anyone that you can work with. Okay? And all you're doing is filling your consciousness with that in the other person, which is the pure light. Okay? I have all these pictures. I can take the picture of Ramakrishna and sit down with it, and pretty soon, or Ramana Maharshi, or my guru, and pretty soon, Tears are streaming down my face and I'm quivering just with delight over the love that I feel in that other being. Okay? Just because you keep opening and opening and opening and opening and opening to the higher and higher places. Okay? So, nobody says I am unloved or I am unloving. That's all a hype. That isn't it. That you just become a certain way and then, believe me, you are surrounded with love. You're drowned in love. The more I can become centered in love, the more everywhere I look, I see loving eyes looking at me. I see people that love me and, and, and are open to me. And it's extraordinary. I sometimes, when I've spoken in an evening and there's like a thousand people, it scares me because I'm being drowned in love. And then I say, who's scared and who's being drowned? It's that trivial ego that wants to collect it all for itself. Do you love me? Do you love me? That's the ego. And that one's getting too much. It's can't, you know, it's like, uh, you want water? Well, here's Niagara Falls, you know. <laughs> you know that kind of Until finally you have to give up he who can drink. See? You gotta give it up because it's like, it's the horror of having all your desires happen, see. It's like, you want it? Okay, baby, here. You know? <laughs> and I look at the picture of Maharaji, I say, come on, baby, cut it out. Not so heavy. Couldn't you give it to me in little doses I can enjoy? You know, it's so much. <clears throat> See, the, 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 the key place is the relation between dualism and non-dualism. And the closest thing you can do is get to the point where you flicker in and out of those two places. Where through total love, it's just like the same image that I often use is 
sometimes I've been making love to somebody and we are locked in bodily union. We are in the deepest possible body penetration and psychic space of intimacy. There's so much that it is beyond two-ness. There's only one of us at that moment. And then at certain points, we pull back and might look into each other's eyes in a dualistic act to say, we come down in order to, do, to dig, the, to experience the bliss that we are when we go beyond the experiencers. In other words, we come back into the experiences to enjoy the bliss and then go back into the oneness where we are bliss. We are not any longer experiencing it. We just are in a state. And then we come back and say, yeah, wow, that too, and then go back. And you go in and out of that place. And when you dig that place, and you, I watched my guru for a long time to figure out how his game works, you know. And then I began to see his fingers always moving. He's always doing mantra to Ram, 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 Ram. And he's doing it in relation to his breath. And that with every breath, he goes in and out of dualism. That the place where you breathe in, and then there's that little place before you breathe out. There's, and then as you breathe out, there's a little place before you breathe in. And we ignore those little places. And when you ta talk about your breath, you think of it almost as a, as a spike curve. Just breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. But it's actually the place between the in-breath and the out-breath and the place between the out-breath and the in-breath that is samadhi. It's the place of unity. And the way he works is with each breath change, he goes in and out of the place of one and two, and it's all done in total love. And that's the place you stay finally, right at the edge, and you do everything you do all day, but you do it in that state of total just on the edge of dualism, you come back in order to love it all. That's the way bhakti yoga works.
state you were in with that method after about three hours. <laughs> As you go through all your fun and games, you know, all the, <laughs> and then you get into that place of Hare Krishna, and it's just a place, it's a space. And you just get deeper and deeper into it, and you just fall away, because you've just been doing it, and doing it, and doing it, and doing it, and you go through all the changes. And everybody gets a chance to stand by and watch and participate and be an actor and be bored. And then the whole thing comes into a place. And you just keep going and going and going and going. It just gets more and more and more and more. It's deeper. I've done it sometimes. The longest I've done it is for six and a half hours. Just all night long, just keep the fire going and just keep one chant, just one chant going. And it'll take you through psychic space after psychic space after psychic space after psychic space. And you just keep opening and you look at everybody around you as Krishna and Ram and you're, you're singing love songs to everybody in the room all the time. Everybody in the universe, all forms. Like engrossed as the bee of my mind and the blue lotus feet of my divine mother. <laughs> She's around too. Now the 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 risk with a method like that is that you get too attached to the fun and games of it, which there are, of course. I mean, it's just fun to dance and to sing and to do all that stuff at one level. At another level, it's an act of worship, and only when it keeps opening up as an act of worship do you keep going out on it. But you can get addicted to just the beauty of it. 
the beauty of the sound, enjoy the aesthetics of it. That's why going on and on for long times. In New Mexico, when we inaugurated our, our new uh, spiritual house, which is like a hogan, it's all made of adobe and it's got a huge central area with seats on different planes up and a big fire. For 24 hours, we did Om Man Ne Ped Me Hung. Just 24 hours, we did it together. Just on and on and on and on. And there is a there are chemical as well as psychological processes you go through, through any of these rituals. And you breathe the life force into the ritual by letting it, by going beyond all the places where you would normally stop. Just keep going out. So it takes you to somewhere new. Somewhere new. As the meditation, as the Tai Chi, as the Karma Yoga, as the Bhakti Yoga, as the Gyan Yoga, as Tantric Yoga, all start to work, you come more and more and more and more into what, look, I am being, look, the rebirth it's the being born again experience. And you feel very vulnerable and you feel very childlike and newborn. And it's kind of scary because all your hip ways of knowing how it all is just sort of fall away because they were all looking at it from the wrong place. And you have to become childlike again. And as that quality of childlikeness starts to develop in you, you can honor it rather than rejecting it because it's your salvation. It's just what you've been waiting for. And so when you can sing a love song with that just childlike openness, and slowly, fatigue and a whole set of things take you through into that place. That's the way it's working until you are like allowing yourself to be that vulnerable. Again. And all the methods you use, you use from a place which when the method starts to work, it's all different. It's all different. In other words, once the door starts to open, once the thing starts to happen to you, all the stuff I've said is absolute nonsense. Absolute nonsense. Because you don't sit around figuring out how to, how to get there when you're already there.
So some of us get into, we know that like acid will take us to a place really awful close to there if it's not there. And so we do that again. And what in fact we do is we override, by doing that, we override all the, the reasons why we're not there all the time. We chemically just push them aside so we get there. You do it with pranayama too. Pranayama is the same thing. It overrides the things you're not. And that's why you go into the kingdom of heaven and then you get booted out again because you're not ready to stay in it. And after you've gone in and out enough, you get to the place where you're perfectly content to just let it all unfold, the rate it unfolds, because you see that you can't rush the process, that even the, the desire to rush it is a desire you've got to give up. can't get greedy for enlightenment because it comes at the rate it comes anyway. And the greediness is just another place along the path. Okay? Just another place. And all I can do is keep telling about traps that you can come that the minute you see it's a trap, you cannot get caught in it, like the trap of dishonesty with yourself about where you're at. Like in that singing, we were all at different levels of how open we are. Some of us would like to be more open than we are. Some of us can immediately just give up ourselves and just merge, but that's very few. And the rest are trying, and trying becomes the place that is another place. It's a place over there and the, you know, three miles down the road over there, you'll come to a place called trying. That's a place, an interesting place. Sit there for a few incarnations. I tried, he tried. Can't say he didn't try. But trying is beyond the winning, so says the book of Tao, and it says it quite rightly. Trying is just another place. In India, they talk about the about people who are very sattvic, that is, they're very pure and they're aimed towards the light. They're good people. They're good people. And they say, Ramakrishna says, everybody is caught in the chains of their own desire. The sattvic person's chains are made of gold, not iron. But a chain is still a chain. And a lot of people get so good, they're just good in the way they're doing it all and they're doing their, their sadhana each day, their spiritual work, and they're being good and kind and all that, and nothing's happening. You just feel the totally mechanical way in which they are becoming, they're just stuck in a place where they're going towards enlightenment. That's their trip. Because the thing is, you've got to even give up goodness got to give up trying. You've got to give it all up. You've got to be right here now. So if you don't feel like singing, I don't feel like singing. That's who I am now. Not, well, I'll make believe I feel like singing because I think I ought to want to feel like singing. That degree of honesty is the only thing that makes it. Everything less than that falls short. The, the absolute forced honesty to be exactly where you are at any moment just exactly where you are. Which means that you have to recognize a lot of your desires that are still uncooked seeds. We can all read Buddha's life or the high lives and then try to make believe we are it. But it doesn't work. It's the difference between a rock and roll band that, that writes a very high song out of their own state of being and another band that plays it in a mimicry sense. That if you're sensitive, you just get turned on by one band and you don't get turned on by another. Like when I experience depression, or dis yeah, depression, instead of denying the depression, I'm too holy to be depressed. Obviously, I'm not depressed. What could depression mean to a person like, you know, that bullshit? Okay. The fact is, here I am, I'm depressed, man. Wow. See? 
And it takes, the, it's very tricky because I get into a game with everybody else where they say, oh, aren't you high? Aren't you? Oh, wow, wow, wow. You know, and then suddenly you're depressed. Okay? And you got to be depressed. And you look around and, wow, dig this depression. Whew, isn't that fierce? You see the depression and it's like a gray room with no doors. <clears throat> I am in a depression. And then by allowing the depression to be, you immediately see the way through and out. For example, I'll give you another kind of yoga based on this sound called Nod Yoga. In Nod Yoga, you just take earplugs, which are over there. You just take any kind of earplugs or stuff, and you stuff up your ears. It's a very simple yoga. Just sit down, stuff your ears, and start to listen to the sounds inside. And you will start to hear one sound or another. You may hear waterfalls. You may hear a crowd in a railroad station. You may hear the sound of crickets or thousands of bees buzzing or flutes or drums or cymbals. There are a whole set of possibilities. There's nine of them, actually. You can label them with different words, but there's nine different sounds. And the game is to listen to whatever sound is, is dominant at that moment and then bring your mind to one-pointedness on that sound until you become the sound and then you use that sound as the base from which you listen to the next sound. Okay? See, so anybody can do this yoga. It's a very, very good yoga, by the way. So you just put the, your, you know, go into the earphone, into the, put the earplugs in, go inside, and you start to listen, then you hear the ocean, like listening through a conch shell. So you listen and listen and listen until the ocean just absorbs you and fills you and you are the ocean. And then at that point, you'll start to hear the next one. Suddenly there'll be these crickets in the distance. And you just climb the chakras, you climb the astral planes through these sounds, one after another after another. It's a very, very good yoga, by the way, to do. Very good yoga. See, so what's happened to me, for example, is like I used to love music. Played the cello. Loved classical music. Then I loved rock and folk music. Then I loved rock and roll music. Then I loved Indian music. And I continued to love all the rest of it as I loved more and more music. And I loved more and more subtle forms of music until finally it started to, that I sat in India for many months just looking at a wall with no music around other than when we'd sing Hare Krishna which or Ram or something like that which I loved or Sri Ram J Ram. And then pretty soon I started to do this inner thing and the inner sounds were so powerful and beautiful that I began to see that all external sound had to go through my eardrum which which was merely the crudest approximation of the inner sounds that I was hearing. And pretty soon it got higher for me to sit and put earplugs in than to listen to stereophonic earphones. It was the same thing that happened with my thought process. It got to the point where I can't even imagine really a movie that will really turn me on ever again because I can't imagine any kind of linear storyline that I'll take in through my senses that will be as high as my own life experiences are because every moment is like baklava. It's so many levels of absurdity, cosmic humor, poignancy, everything. It's all storylines all at once. And I'm supposed to come down to follow somebody else's mind trip and take it in through these gross senses, which is a very delicate matter because it turns out then that the only kind of art and music is that which helps you become conscious. See, And that's why you end up looking at mandalas See, mandalas are visual devices, just like the sound was for the auditory one. If you've seen a mandala, it's a, it's a square, it's got four gates, and then in the gates are a circle, and then it squares within circles, and then the circles get inner and inner until there's an inner circle. And when you go to a Tibetan physician, see, and you happen to be sick with something or other, a mental or a physical illness, he doesn't give you a prescription, say, go down and get three phenobarbital or something like that. He gives you a mandala. Okay? And you take the mandala home and you stick it up on the wall and you sit down in front of it and you look at it. Okay? 
And what you do is you let your field of vision become the entire mandala, and then very slowly as you let it happen, you get sucked in more and more into the center. And the particular center of the particular mandala he's given you, when you go through that center, you, take, you come into it and then go through it, that puts you into a space where the thing that was wrong with you doesn't exist anymore. Okay, that's how highly articulated this game is. It's the same thing as faith healing. See, the way faith healing works is the faith healer is functioning at a vibration different than the vibration at which the illness exists. And all he does is take you to a vibrational rate where the illness doesn't manifest anymore because you are somebody else and that somebody else doesn't have that illness. And all he does is give you a contact high with his vibrational rate. And mandalas are very high visual statements, so pretty soon you start to see mandalas in everything you look at. You take each thing and it'll take you out in a certain way and that'll teach you something else. It'll finish off another trip. But something very profound happens along this journey and you've got to appreciate that when it happens to you, you will experience horror and discomfort and a feeling like you've lost some of the exquisiteness of life because you're not enjoying the flash you're used to from the things you used to enjoy them from. And you say, wow, what's happening? Am I becoming dead? Is life turning off? Okay. And you've got to accept transformations that occur in you when whole new things. One couple I was with the other day said, you know, when we, when we kiss and start to make love, we, st we burst out laughing. Because in a way, we're already higher than the place we have to come back into to go through this dance. And we haven't yet figured out a high enough way to do the dance so that we don't have to go back into our old habits, which, which seem so trivial to us in view of where we are together. Gurdjieff, somebody said to Gurdjieff, our friends don't find us as interesting as they used to now that we're doing the work. Gurdjieff says, it's only the beginning, I'll tell you. And it is interesting because there's no desire to come on to other people so much. The whole social conversation thing becomes like, yeah, what's that all about? The hanging out, the model of hanging out, which is dear and near to most of our hearts for many years. I mean, I remember like when I got done with cocktail parties. Like I thought, wow, I will never have to go to another cocktail party. Isn't that groovy? I don't have to have to hold a martini and say, how very interesting. You don't say, well, tell me more. <laughs> have you thought about the implications? You know, that kind of crap. Or on and on, that little dance we do. So then I got super hip. So we'd, we'd have the big hash pipe and we'd all get zonked on hash and we'd listen to the grooviest rock and roll music. And we'd hang out together and we'd go on mind trips. And sound trips and food trips. Have you ever tasted pickle with, you know, <laughs> coleslaw with ice cream with, you know, that whole combination in a pizza roll, you know, like that? While you're in a bath with candles and incense. And, you know, And for three years, I was just like super sensual as Sam. Wow, well, it was just never enough, you know, like, yeah, I, I, boy, I walked far to get a new kind of thing, you know. <laughs> and then I got into this funny place where it was, you know, I'd sit home and somebody would say, like, come on over and hang out. And I think, oh, wow. Here we go again. It, it, the finiteness became obvious. And then it blew my mind that the only exciting new place was when I sat with an absolutely blank wall in front of me with no sound, with earplugs in my ears. And I kept getting higher and higher and higher. And I go, oh, wow, ooh, wow. Ah, ah. And the thing was that I never got bored. And I started to get scared, like, what is the implication of this? You know, like, <laughs> Because uh, when I used to teach at nursery school, you'd see a kid like that and you'd call him a social isolate and you'd call in his parents and you'd say, we have a real problem here. This child doesn't mix with other children. You know? And all of the social forms we all graduated into already become archaic. I mean, you've used them up already. Which forms are you going to find until finally you sit around in a room 
and nobody talks because nobody has anything to say. See? Because we all know all that stuff. What are you going to say it for? You have to prove anything to me or anything? And what's how weird when you do you ever walk into a room where everybody's just sitting there silently without a role, rule saying everybody's to be silent? Everybody goes through the tension trip, like feeling inadequate. Are they supposed to do something? Or isn't there some social conversation that's to be carried on? Something's supposed to happen? What's happening, man? Nothing. <laughs> what's going to happen? Nothing. <laughs> what could happen? Nothing. Okay. Try living in that space for a while. Now, to help us reorganize our lives, sometimes we create new environments where we impose rules, like we impose the rule of silence. It's like, I use this chalkboard for months and months, just writing everything on a chalkboard. And you got so that it's such a hassle to write. It's such a hassle to write. Who cares? You know, why even say it? Just, <laughs> we'll just sit here. The only thing you put in is like, milk or you know i love you or really important messages you know i mean i now get a whole groups of this is it far out i get more letters now practically one a week that all it has in it is like 20 or 30 pages of rom 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 it's all in like sanskrit just symbol rom 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 or om 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 and i read it page by page by page <laughs> because the person wrote me a letter see and they said the highest possible thing they could say instead of hello how are you do you know what happened last tuesday and you know that's all the divine mother that's all stuff it's beautiful Finally, we have very little to communicate with one another about, and that becomes a little scary. And that doesn't mean we don't do what has to be done. If I have to talk to you about the laundry, we'll talk about the laundry. But the rest of it starts to fall away because it's enough. Each moment is enough. Sitting with a blank wall with earplugs in your ear is enough. And yet the whole model you've built of life <coughs> is doing things where that isn't enough. See, that's why you move away from cities often, because you move away from high energy centers, because you don't need all that stimulation. <coughs> you see that people in cities are all addicted to stimulation. They're on an adrenaline addiction. You know, riots and excitement and stuff happening and cars and horns and... <coughs> and when you center enough, then you can live in cities, and it's the same as living in the country. It doesn't make any difference. Until finally you're walking down the street and the inner sounds are there, see, and everything's a mandala. See, that's what starts to happen, you see. Everybody you look at's the same person. Wait till that happens. That's an interesting one. <laughs> They're all your lover. They're all the beloved you've always loved for eternity. They're all every human being you've ever met. Everybody's everybody. It's really strange. See, now, this doesn't mean you've lost. All, all the time when you develop each new one, you think you lost something to develop it because you feel you gave it up. And the thing that keeps turning up is that everything you give up, you end up having. The minute you've given it up, you have it again, but you have it plus something else. You have it in a new way. In other words, I haven't lost my ability to discriminate. I can tell you're wearing red socks and you're barefoot. and you know I can see all that stuff. But I still, when I look at you, I see light. When I look at you, I see light. When I look at you, I see light. I see light and form. And the thing is, the light is the dominant factor for me now, while before the form was, before individual differences were the big deal. That's how you get ahead in, in this world. Be better and better at the game of individual differences. Do it faster and faster. And the person that can do individual differences most exquisitely gets to the top of the heap. And that's what education is about. Learning more and more individual differences, discriminations. How do you discriminate? More dimensions. How do you analyze more dimensions? And then when you start to flip over, so everything is the same. It's all the Divine Mother. Now, if you're in the stage where you get stuck in that plane, then you're locked up. Somebody comes up and says, do you know right from wrong? And you say, it's all the Divine Mother. And boy, three psychiatrists will sign right away. <laughs> no doubt about it. No doubt about it. And so 
there are interesting steps that you experience when you're relating to people. Some people, some of us are at the place where we're just beginning the dance. And our question is, how do you take off? How do you get it going? Others, it's going so fast. The only question is, how do you keep it together? I mean, I meet people that I look at, and they look at me, and I see they're seeing like light and astral things and all, and I go up and say, hey, baby, keep it together. Uh, and they say, I say, I'm just me, and you're you, and here we are, and this is the floor, and that's the way it is, right? Okay. It's like that thing that happened to me in New York City at that uh, Unitarian Church where a guy who was very far out with a crucifix and a yarmulke and all, all dressed in black, when I was doing Hare Krishna and standing there all in white, he came up and there was a box of fresh strawberries somebody got, and he took two strawberries and crushed them in my hands. See? And he was crucifying me as I was dancing in front of the people doing Hare Krishna. In front of, you know, we were dancing. I was the only one dancing at the time. And I was standing there all in white, and suddenly I felt this wet, and I opened my eyes. <laughs> Now, at this point, I dig the high camp, you know. <laughs> I dig, like, if, baby, if this isn't showbiz, here we are in the middle of a Unitarian church with Christ having his feet washed with a disciple, and here are this, oh, wow, it's so far out. I mean, at every possible level, you know. <laughs> but simultaneously, I am aware that somebody has brought an oriental rug and that I got two strawberries in my hand. If they get on the rug, they're going to ruin the rug, see? <laughs> Now, in that moment, I see that what I have to do is stop and hold the strawberry, see? Okay, now that's called keeping it all together. In other words, you've got to keep all the levels going. If you can be Christ being crucified, just don't let the strawberries drip on the carpet, see? And that, I began to see that that's what it meant of keeping it all together, see? Keeping it all together. I, like somebody, I, somebody will call me and I'll say, uh, they'll say, would you send me these uh, th these photographs uh, for the papers or something? I'll say, sure, man, give me your address. And they'll give me the address. I'll say, what's your zip code? And the guy said, oh, I don't know. I say, well, baby, like, come on, be conscious. Now, you got to play the game at every level. You're dealing in a system where the males are t using the zip codes. Why don't you know your zip code? As if I'm too conscious to know my zip code. <laughs> See? <laughs> like, I can't be bothered with that. But a conscious being, there isn't any bother. You just do it all because you, you exist at every level in the game. See? And you've got to acknowledge every single level at which you exist in which this physical level is one of them, in which you use zip codes. And if you keep it together like that, then it's always harmonious. There's never any difficulties. Any difficulties is because you slipped up on one plane or another. Because you weren't here there, too. You'll be here all of them, all the time. And the way you can do that, if you try to do that linearly with your thoughts, try to think your way through every plane, you can't do it. Like you meet somebody and say, here you are, beautiful girl, and I'm man, and I desire you at the same time. You're God, I'm God. You can't go like go through that trip all the time, man. You'd be wiping yourself. You'd be exhausted at the end of the day, <laughs> walking down the street with that thought sequence. So the way to do it is to empty your mind completely of all of them. And any label that we give each other, forget it. That isn't, it isn't that one either, see? And then we just flow, and I meet you, and it's just like liquid stuff. We're just flowing together. We just flow in, and then if there's reason for us to be together, we're together. And if there's not, we flow on. And it's just flowing process with no models at all. There aren't any models. You only have a model when you need a model for some specific thing. Like somebody says, would somebody pick the women out in this room? Well, then I can come to the level there are women and men. But otherwise, I don't sit around saying, oh, there's a woman, there's a man. Now, I know that's a woman. I don't know <laughs> Thing is not to lose the ability to discriminate, but not to get addicted to it. Not to get addicted.
I, I, I just have a couple of more words, and then I probably should stop. Um, the thing about finding teachers or gurus, it is quite important that you understand that the nature of the relationship between a guru and a chela, or a disciple of a guru, is not an interpersonal relationship. That is, there is nothing in the relationship that has anything to do with this, this plane of reality. The level at which it exists on this plane is totally trivial. And that the going to find your guru is as phony a trip as any other trip. It's saying it can't happen till I find my guru, which is what's keeping it from happening. And the way, the best image I have of the whole process now is that one where you see an airplane, an airfield, and the guru is circling in a holding pattern, waiting for the runway to be cleared, and you are busy driving up and down the runway looking for the guru, see? And you're looking out on a horizontal plane for the guru, and he's waiting for you to get the hell off the runway so he can land. That's roughly the way I understand the relation between a guru and a chela. He is always exactly where you are, and all it means is you've got to turn off all your stuff in order to be able to receive him and get into that relationship. That if a guru is what he is, and he is, and there's only one of them, then it is you, it's, it is always exactly where you are when you are ready to receive him. There's no way you've got to go to find him. All you've got to do is open yourself to be receptive to that possibility. Now, teachers are something else. Teachers point the way, gurus beckon from beyond. And the teachers that you will need for the different parts of your particular unique method, upaya, in view of where you aren't, will become apparent to you as soon as you can ask the right questions about yourself. That is, as soon as you can define where you're not, then you start to look for that teacher who can deal with that particular thing where you are not, like take your body. Once you begin to see that your body is holding you down, you're suddenly tuned to all these body trips that everybody's on. And then you start to look for one that is in harmony with what level of spirit you are seeking. And a lot of the body trips you find out are just ego body trips. And then you find some that are very pure body trips. And you climb into one, and then that teacher teaches you what they have to teach. And then you go on from there. <coughs> That's in the role of specific teachers for specific methods. That you're asking the right question is what finds you the teacher. And the just general free-floating, where can I find a teacher, is, is not, you're not really asking yet. You've got to hurt somewhere first. Because teachers are very specific. Each one can teach you a certain thing. Each one can, and finally, you will need many teachers. Many teachers along the way. I have a teacher who is an Egyptian scholar who is teaching me geometry. Okay? Because in geometry are some of the purest statements of the laws of the universe, as every Egyptian Egyptologist knows. Okay? And I went through, ah, man, I got to learn geometry. I take algebra this term and geometry the next, you know, that was the level at which I went through geometry. And now I'm seeing it. It's like he starts me with my first arithmetic lesson, right? And he says, what is two? So I say, it's one plus one. He says, how could that be? There's only one. <laughs> well, what is two? Two is one divided in half. Because nothing can be bigger than one since it's all one. In other words, it's got to be, unity is the highest place you can get to. So what are you going to create systems that are other than, there's only one whole number. So the whole mathematics is based on fractions. Because as is true above, so below. It's all going to be true in every system. The system's going to be a pure representation. Right? And now I'll go probably to uh, South America for a while. And I'll study with a Sufi, and I'm not studying with it. It's very interesting 
why I am going to this teacher. I am going to this teacher because everything I've heard about him turns me off. The whole model of secret schools bugs me. I don't believe in secrets. The whole idea of a guy who's like very worldly and teaches you how to be very worldly, that turns me off. And it's just that turnoff that sensitizes me to the fact that there are uncooked seeds in me that make me go to him to say, okay, here we go. Because I stick with, I'll go to a holy man that's out, out of this world and then I'll come back and do worldly stuff. And here is a man who teaches holy man things through worldly stuff. He gets you so that you smoke pot and then you drive around in cars through cities and drink orange aid. Right? Great, great trip. I've done that already. See, But he's going to do it like teaching me something through it. He's a tough teacher, I guess. And then I'll go back to my Hindu teacher and he will teach me new breathing things and new body things and take my body and my nerves to a new level. And then I'll go to a Buddhist monastery and I will sit for months and I will just, every day I will get up and sit eight, ten hours a day and just sit and clear my mind. And it's such an exciting curriculum, I can't, uh, you know, it's only just what will happen first, you know. <laughs> Because all of those will cook seeds that aren't yet cooked in me. They'll all help me through other trips. And you begin to see that you need a variety of teachers for this journey. Variety of teachers. Um, for those of you that haven't heard it, um, there is a book being prepared, a box being prepared, actually, um, which is um, to be given away free. And um, when I was with my guru in India, he said, he sent his blessing. I was keeping notes of what was happening in the temple because it was all so far out. I mean, who would believe it? So I thought I'll make little notes so I won't forget it, <laughs> which is absurd, of course. And I got a message saying he sends his blessing, Ashabad, for your book. And I said, well, what book is that? And they said, whatever book it is you're writing, he sent his blessings for. <laughs> so I concluded I was supposed to write a book. <laughs> so I came back to America and I sat down at a typewriter and I wrote a book. And I sent it to all these publishers and they wrote back and they said, well, we're sorry, but our line is full in that area. And we <laughs> maybe another publisher. We have a lot of mystic stories from the East. And <laughs> So I thought, well, if the guru is who he is, he's the publisher too, and he wouldn't turn his own book down. So obviously that isn't the book. Right. You hear that logic? I'm going to go through that. See, he's everything. If he is who I know he is, then he's the publisher too. That's a big trip for you. So I waited, and then in the course of a few years, there were a lot of these tapes done of these kinds of things and some were higher and some were lower and then this groovy woman in New York started to type them all up until she had a big stack of them all typed up and then a guy in California went through them and he said you know it's very far out some of the tapes parts of them are really kind of professory heavy teachy and some of them are really far out they get like iambic pentameter they're just like phrases you just like way way out so we cut out all the heavy stuff and we kept all the, the high stuff. We put it all together and we had this book. It had 108 pages in it. Uh, and uh, <laughs> So the way we're doing that book is that we've got a group of, there are, I don't know if it's five or eight. I haven't been there yet, but it's five or eight people. It started on April 6th. And every morning they rise they're living in the mountains in new mexico every morning they rise at five and they meditate until eight and then they take food and then they they it's all done silently and they have these four foot by four foot sheets and they hand rubber stamp each letter of this book onto these pages these so it's all organically done and then the artists draw all around these on each page and then at the end each page is photo offset and reduced then the manuscript is sent to Japan where it's all being done on um, rice paper and hand, <laughs> the whole thing, you know, right? 
So that was the core book. And then somebody said, well, if you're going to put that out, we're going to do 20,000 copies, right? If you're going to put that out, why don't you? And it's Maharaji's book. It's the Guru's book. I mean, it's not anybody else's book, but his. It's his blessing. Somebody said, would you include that bibliography you've got? We said, okay. And they said, you got all these holy pictures you hang around the walls. Could you put in some of those? Okay. Would you mind putting in two copies so we don't have to tear it out of the book? You know, we'll have an extra set in the back. Okay. You said, all those quotes you have, could you put in some of those quotes so we could stick them up or near the toilet, and near the door, you know? It's nice by the door as you're leaving to have the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step, you know, just as you're walking out every morning. <laughs> that kind of thing. Okay, we'll put the little deck of cards. So now it's not a book anymore. See, it's like a box now because it's got these pictures in it and these little cards. And somebody said, say there's some groovy chanting in some of these evenings. Could you put a record in of all the chanting? <laughs> so now we're working on a 12-inch record on both sides with Ram and, uh, and mantra. One whole side is, or one part of one side is just a ditya hridayam, is the teaching of the, the giving of that mantra. And then there are these other songs and kirtan. And uh, then somebody said, look, you teach breathing and asanas and all that stuff and how to eat and how to live and puja tables. Couldn't you put all that into like a little cookbook? About So we have a cookbook for psychic space. Just going in there. And then somebody said, say, could you put in something I could give to my parents? They don't, you know, the, book, the fire book will be too far out. I mean, just a straight storyline. You went to India and what happened to you? Know. <laughs> or somebody said, for my parole officer, could I have something? <laughs> So we have a straight story, the little storybook, his story, it's called his story. <laughs> his story. And then there's this box and there's a mandala on the box and it's all being put together. And so all of part of the funds that you all pay in that make this all happen, all the money that I get goes to that. It's costing us $30,000 to do this thing. And we're giving it away, see, which is very far out. I always wanted to do that. You know? It's just a complete undercutting of everything I was taught. <laughs> sure, it's infantile rebellion, but whatever it is. Uh, so that'll be ready late in the summer or so on. And I have postcards, which I guess we'll have to get out of the car. Um, which you can take if you want one. You just put a, your name and address and a little stamp on it and send it in, and it says. When the book is ready, notify me, and then if you want it, you can have it. Okay. Then anybody, because you've already paid for it, because you're you you're providing the green energy to make it happen. Okay. <coughs> Danny, uh, there's a box that is uh, unopened in the back seat. If you don't find any loose ones in the back seat. Krishna Mangala Sita Ram. 